Chapter 7 In the preceding chapter, I made you acquainted with the calamity which befell our patient, and of the serious position in which I found myself placed with Nicola in consequence. While knowing in my own heart that I was quite innocent of any intentional neglect of duty, I had yet to remember that I had remained on watch instead of leaving the room to ascertain what had befallen the Donna Consuelo. It would, in all probability, never have occurred. On the other hand, I had signalled Dr. Nicola and called him to my assistance before abandoning my charge. How it was that he had not answered my summons was more than I can understand. As it transpired afterwards, however, and as is usual in such things, the explanation was a very simple one. In the last chapter I said that when he left me to go to the laboratory, he was quite exhausted. He had eaten nothing for many hours, and as a natural result, the fumes of the herbs he was distilling had overpowered him, and he had fallen in a dead faint upon the floor. As long as I live, I shall retain the recollection of the next fourteen hours. During the whole of that time, Nicola and I fought death inch by inch for the body of the old Don. From midnight until the following afternoon, neither of us crossed the threshold of the sick chamber. And during the whole of that time, save to give me brief directions, Nicola spoke no word to me at all. It was only when the mercury in the clinical thermometer was once more established on its accustomed mark that he addressed me. Rearranging the bed covering and wiping his clammy forehead with his pocket handkerchief, he turned to me. I think he will do now, he said, provided he does not lose ground within the next half hour. We may take it for granted that he's out of danger. This was the opportunity for which I was waiting. I accordingly seized it. I'm afraid, Dr. Nicola, I said, mustering with courage as I progressed, that you consider me to blame for what has happened. He looked sharply at me and then said coldly, I failed to see how I could very well think otherwise. I left you in charge and you deserted your post. But I assure you, I continued, that you are misjudging me. I could not help myself. I heard the girl scream and ran to her assistance. At the same time, I took care to ring the bell for you before I left the room. You should not have left it at all until I had joined you, he answered, with the still same icy tone. As a matter of fact, I did not hear your summons. I had fainted. And the other question, what was the girl doing in this portion of the castle? She was hysterical, I answered. I was searching for her great-grandfather. She did not know herself how she got here, but as ill luck would have it, she saw your terrible people and was frightened nearly to death in consequence. For common humanity's sake, I could not leave her as she was. Having rung for you, I naturally thought you were with the dawn, and that I was free to render her what assistance I could. Your argument is certainly plausible, but supposing the man had died during your absence, how would you have felt then? I should have regretted it all my life, I answered. But surely you must admit... That would have been better than that young girl should have been driven mad by fear. You do not seem to understand, Nicola replied, that I would willingly sacrifice a thousand girls to accomplish this great object I have in view. No, no, Ingleby, you have been found wanting in your duty. You have checked the progress of the experiment. If that old man had died, here he took a step towards me. His face suddenly became livid with passion. As I live at this moment, you would never have seen the light of day again. I swear I would have killed you with as little compunction as I would have destroyed a dog who had bitten me. So menacing was his attitude, and so fiendish the expression on his face, that I instinctively recalled a step from him. However, I don't think my worst enemy could accuse me of being a coward. Was the man a lunatic, I asked myself? Had the magnitude of his discovery turned his head? If so, I must be careful in my dealings with him. I'm afraid I do not understand you, Dr. Nicola, I said, trying to appear calmer than I really felt. You talk in an exaggerated fashion, and one which I cannot permit. I confess to being a certain measure to blame for what has happened, 
but if you feel that you can no longer repose trust in me that you once did i would rather resign my post and leave your house at once for a moment i thought i had detected a sign of fear in his face then his manner changed completely my dear ingleby he said patting me on my shoulder and speaking in quite a different tone if i hurt your feelings just now i hope you will forgive me and describe it to my anxiety for the last two days as you are aware i have been overwrought i stated that i considered you to blame i said more than i meant for of course i know that you had no intention of injuring our patient or of doing anything to prejudice the end that we have in view it was a combination of unfortunate circumstances the ill effects of which by good luck we have been able to remedy let us forget all about it with all my heart i said with a momentary friendliness i have never felt for him before and held up my hand to him he took it and when to my surprise i found that his hand was as cold as ice in this fashion the cloud between us appeared to have blown away but though it was no longer visible to the naked eye it still existed for i was unable to dispel from my mind the recollection of the threat he had used to me if he were not in earnest now he had at least been so then and for my own part i put more faith in his threats than in his protestations of friendship come come this will never do said nikola after a few moments silence which had followed after our reconciliation it is nearly three o'clock you had better go to your room and rest for a couple of hours after which you can relieve me seeing his haggard and weary face i offered to remain on duty while he went to lie down but to this he would not consent it was plain he was still brooding over what had happened and that he did not intend to trust me any further and he was absolutely obliged accordingly i did not press him but as soon as i had noted the various temperatures and had done what i could to help him i left him to his vigil and went to my own apartment i had had nineteen hours in the sick room and in consequence was completely worn out during that time i had heard nothing of the donna consuelo when i laid my head upon my pillow and closed my eyes a terrified face as i had seen it the previous night rose before me even then i could feel the thrill which had run through me as i took that lovely body in my arms what place was this terrible castle i asked myself for such a woman how dreary was the life she was compelled to lead in it without companions cut off from the one person who only a week before had been all the world to her this suggested another and sweeter thought to me was there only one person she loved i remembered how she had clung to me in the hall and how she had appealed to me to save her the mere thought that there might be something more than simple liking in her attitude was sufficient to set my heart beating like a sledgehammer was it possible that i could be falling in love i who had thought myself done with that sort of thing for ever i smiled at the idea the nice sort of position i was in to contemplate such a thing and yet i was so lonely in the world that it soothed me to think there might be someone to whom i was a little more than the average man and that someone was a beautiful and noble woman with these thoughts in my brain i fell asleep a moment later so it seemed the electric bell above my head brought me wide awake again one glance at my watch was sufficient however to show me that i had been asleep two hours i dressed as quickly as possible and returned to the don's room where much to my relief nikola informed me there had been no relapse and that all was progressing as satisfactorily as he could wish bidding me exercise the greatest vigilance he left me and staggered from the room a little more of this sort of thing my friend i said to myself as i watched him pass out of the door only a little more and you will be unfit for anything but i had yet to learn the strength of nikola's constitution he was like a steel bow he might often be bent but never broken it was not until the following morning that i saw donna consuelo again we met upon the battlements as usual dr ingleby she said after we had been standing together some time i feel there is something i should say to you i want to tell you how sorry i am for what occurred the other night 
but for my folly in wandering about the castle as I did, I should not have seen. She paused for a moment, and a shudder swept over her face at the recollection. I should not have seen what I did, and you would not have got into trouble with Dr. Nicola. How do you know that I did get into trouble with Dr. Nicola? I asked. Because Dr. Nicola spoke to me about it, she replied. On hearing this, I pricked up my ears. Had Nicola taken her to task for what she had done? In all probability, it blamed her. I tried to catch her on this point, but she would tell me nothing. You will accept my apology, won't you? she asked. It's made me so unhappy. You must apologise to me at all, I answered. I assure you, none is needed. I would have given anything to have prevented you of seeing, well, what you did, and still more to have prevented Nicola from speaking to you. He had no right to do so. Then, drawing a little closer to her, I took her hand. Donna Consuelo, I said, I'm very much afraid your life here is a very unhappy one. I was happier in Spain, she answered, but I do not want you to think I am grumbling. You have given me your promise that no ill shall befall my great-grandfather, and for this reason I have no fear. If he is well, what right have I to complain of anything that may happen to myself? Some day, perhaps, Dr. Nicola will allow us to go back to Spain, and then I shall forget all about this terrible castle. I wondered if the hope she entertained would ever be realised. But I was not going to permit her to suppose that I entertained any doubt at all about it. I felt I should like to have said more, but prudence restrained me. She looked so beautiful that the temptation was almost more than I could withstand. Whether she knew anything of what was in my mind, I cannot say. But somehow I fancied she must have done so. Though I have no desire to appear conceited, I could not help thinking when we bade each other goodbye, there was a look of sorrow in her face. Once more, a fortnight went by. A month had now elapsed since our arrival at the castle, and as I could plainly see Nicola's experiment, was at length achieving a definite result. The changes effected by the use of electric batteries and a constant anointing which I have already described having ceased within a short time of the removal of the means by which they were occasioned were now almost permanent and were becoming more so every day. The patient's flesh was firmer, his skin more elastic, while his usual pallor had given place to what might be almost described as a healthy tint. So far, success had crowned Nicola's endeavours, but whether the final result would be what he desired was more than I could say. After the little contretemps which followed my mistake, already described, Nicola and I had agreed fairly well together. I was aware, however, that he was suspicious of my intimacy with the old Don's great-granddaughter, and from the way in which he glanced at the patient, and the various instruments whenever he relieved me in the sick room, I could tell he was always anxious to satisfy himself that I had not done anything to prejudice the work we had in hand. It may easily be supposed, therefore, that our partnership was far from being as pleasant as it had promised in London to be. To live in an atmosphere of continual suspicion is unpleasant at any time, but it becomes doubly so when another's happiness depends in a very large measure upon it. Of course the reason was apparent to me. There must have been something more in Nicola's mind than I could fathom. For I think I can assert most truthfully that never for a moment did I allow an effort to be wanting on my part to show how much I had his interest at heart. There was yet another thing which puzzled me. It was this. What was to happen when the required result had been achieved, and the old Don was transformed into a young man again? And more important still, what would become of his great-granddaughter? The whole thing seemed so absurd, so unnatural, if you like it better, that I could see no proper conclusion to it. Still, there was time to talk of that later on. The old Don was already, I am prepared to admit, in a certain sense, younger. That is to say, he did not present that appearance of great age, which had been noticeable on board the Donna Mercedes. At the same time, he was still very far from being a young man. One day I found sufficient courage to speak on this point to Nicola, 
that is one of the most remarkable points in my argument he answered if he were to change his state so quickly i should despair of success as it is i am more than hopeful i am sanguine to-morrow if he continues to progress so favourably we shall enter upon the third stage of the experiment granted that is successful i shall be within measurable distance of the greatest medical discovery of this or any other century knowing it was useless attempting to question him further i was compelled to possess my soul in patience until the time should arrive for him to enlighten me the following morning as soon as i had finished my period of duty in the don's chamber i informed nikola of my intention of going for a short stroll the time he had decided was not ripe yet for the third phase as i knew that i should be kept closely employed as soon as it was i was anxious to obtain as much exercise as possible while i had the opportunity accordingly i placed my hat upon my head and descended into the courtyard strangely enough it was the first time i had set foot in it since our arrival at the castle it was an exquisite morning for walking the sky was blue overhead a brisk breeze was blowing and when i had crossed the drawbridge and looked down into the little bay where the waves rolled in and broke with a noise like thunder upon the beach i felt happier than i had been for some considerable time past i watched the white gulls wheeling above my head and as i did so the recollection of the time when i had last seen them rose before my mind's eye it was the day that i had come so near to speaking words of love to donna consuela upon the battlements i remember the look i had seen in her sweet face and as i did so i realised how much she was to me with a light step and a feeling of elation in my heart i made my way down the path towards the beach not a soul was to be seen for i remembered having heard nicola say that the yacht had gone south for stores reaching the water's edge i stood and looked back at the castle it was a sombre enough place in all conscience and yet there was something about it which affected me in a manner i can scarcely describe i looked at it for a few moments then turning my back upon it i set off along the beach at a brisk pace whistling gaily as i went eventually i reached the further side of the bay opposite that on which the castle was situated here the sand gave place to large rocks which in their turn terminated in a tall headland the view from these rocks was grand in the extreme night and day the rollers of the north sea broke upon them throwing showers of spray high into the air clambering up i struggled for fifty yards or so and finally seating myself upon a rock somewhat larger than the rest to enjoy the view a surprise was in store for me looking back upon the way i had come i caught sight of a figure walking towards me on the sands needless to say it was the donna consuelo whether she was aware of my presence upon the rocks i cannot say i only know that as soon as i saw her i rose from where i was sitting and hastened to meet her how beautiful she looked and how her face lighted up as i came closer are things which i must leave to the imagination of my reader you are further than broader than usual to-day are you not i said as we shook hands might i not say the same of you she answered with a smile the morning was so beautiful that i could not remain in that terrible old building every corner seems to suggest unhappy memories to me do you really think that all the memories connected with it will be unpleasant i inquired she looked up at me in a little startled way and blushed divinely as she did so could you expect me to regard the time i have spent in it with any sort of pleasure she inquired fencing with my meaning and giving me a roland for an oliver only think what i have suffered in it by this time we were strolling back towards the rocks i have already described the beach at this point narrowed considerably and for some reason or another we walked a little nearer the cliff than i had done suddenly my companion stopped and pointing to the sand said you had a companion this morning i i had no companion i answered what makes you think so look here she said and as she spoke she pointed to some footmarks in the sand before us as you went up the beach you walked near the water's edge 
and as you came to meet me you passed midway between your former tracks and the cliff if you did not have a companion whose footprints are these they must have been made this morning for as you are aware when the tide is full it comes right up to the cliffs and would be certain to wash anything out that existed before i stooped and examined the tracks carefully before i answered they were evidently those of a man and from the fact that the sand was hard the outline could be plainly distinguished the foot that was responsible for them was a large one and must have been clad in an extremely clumsy boot i don't know what to think of it i said one thing however is quite certain i had no companion this morning what about the old man and his wife at the castle i happen to know they have both been hard at work all morning she answered besides what object could they have in following you the beach leads nowhere and from here to yonder point there is no place where you can reach the land above i shook my head the problem was too much for me at the same time i must own it disquieted me strangely who was this mysterious person who had dogged my footsteps what could have been his object in following me for a moment i inclined to the belief that it might have been dr nikola who was anxious to discover how i spent my leisure but on second thoughts the absurdity of the idea became apparent to me but if it were not nikola who could it have been on reaching the rocks we seated ourselves and fell to criticising the picture spread before our gaze there was something in my companion's manner this morning which analyse it as i would i could not understand she was by turns light-hearted and sad the two expressions chased each other across her face like clouds across an april sky at last she returned to the topic which i knew must come sooner or later that of her great-grandfather's condition i seem cut off from him for ever she said with infinite sadness i hear nothing of him from week's end to week's end and i see nothing of him he has gone completely out of my life but only for the time being i answered dr nikola has assured you that he will restore him to health and strength think what that will mean and how happy you will be together then i know it's very wrong of me to say so she continued but i cannot keep it back dr ingleby i distrust dr nikola he is deceiving me of that i feel sure knowing what i did i could not contradict her but i saw my opportunity and acted upon it but if you do not trust dr nikola i said am i to suppose that you do not trust me she was silent and i noticed that she turned her face away from me as if she were anxious to study the castle and the cliff what was more i noticed that her hand trembled a little as it rested on the rock beside me once more i put the question and as i did so leant a little towards her i do trust you she answered but so softly i could scarcely hear it consuelo i said in a voice but a little louder than that in which she had addressed me you cannot think what happiness it is to me to hear you say that as i have tried to show you there is nothing i would not do to prove how anxious i am to be worthy of your trust we have known each other but a little longer than a month in that time however i have learnt to know you as well as any man could know a woman i have learnt more than that consuelo i have learnt to love you better than life itself no no she answered you must not say that i cannot hear you but it must be said i answered my love will not be denied you do love me consuelo i can see it in your face don't you think that i watched and longed for it instead of turning her face to me she turned it still further from mine i took a little hand in mine what is your answer consuelo i asked be brave and tell me darling i were brave she said i should tell you what you ask must never be it is hopeless impossible that it would be madness for us to think of such a thing but i am not brave i am so lonely in the world and have lost so much that i cannot lose you also then you love me i cried in such triumph as i had never felt for anything else in my life before thank god thank god for that yes i love you she answered and the great waves breaking on the rocks seemed to echo the happiness we were both feeling over the next half hour i must draw a veil 
by the end of that time it was necessary for me to think of returning to the castle nicola's watch would be up in an hour and i knew it would not do for me to keep him waiting as i said as much to consuelo and we immediately rose and set out on our return as i walked beside her i would not have changed position with any living man so happy was i my peace of mind however was destined to be but short-lived we had crossed the greater number of the rocks and were approaching the sand once more when i received a shock which i shall not forget as long as i can remember anything clambering over the sharp and slippery rocks was by no means an easy business it was however delightful to hold my sweetheart's hand in the pretence of assisting her occasionally it became necessary for us to make considerable detours and once i bade her remain where she was until i had climbed a somewhat bigger rock than usual in order to find out whether we could proceed that way i reached the top i was about to extend my hand to her assistance when something caused me to look behind me judge of my surprise and consternation at finding in the hollow below me a man crouching on the sand watching me it was the chinaman i had seen on board the dona mercedes the man who had thrown the knife which had so nearly terminated nicola's existence how i managed to retain my presence of mind at that trying moment i find it difficult now to understand i only know this that i realised in a flash the fact that it would have been madness to pretend to have seen him accordingly i stood for a moment looking out to sea then with a laugh that must have sounded far from natural i rejoined consuelo on the rock below and chose another path towards the sands what is the matter she inquired when we had proceeded a short distance your face is quite pale i did not feel very well for a moment i answered making use of the first excuse that occurred to me i am afraid you are not telling me the truth she answered i feel convinced something has frightened you can you not trust me under the circumstances i thought it would be better for me to make a clean breast of it i will trust you i answered the fact of the matter is i have discovered an explanation for the footsteps you pointed out to me upon the beach we are being followed when i jumped on top of that rock i found a man lying on the other side of it a man who could he have been why should he be spying on us did you recognize him perfectly i should have known him anywhere then who was he the chinaman we saw on board the steamer the man who stole the drugs nikola entrusted to my care do you mean the man who entered my cabin and bent over to look at me she cried in alarm i nodded and threw a quick glance over my shoulder to discover whether we were still being followed i could see nothing however of the man a circumstance which by no means allayed my anxiety what do you think we'd better do inquired consuelo hasten home as fast as we can and go tell nikola i answered it's imperative he should know at once we accordingly continued our walk at increased speed every now and then throwing apprehensive glances behind us it's possible some of my readers may regard it as an exhibition of cowardice on my part to have sought refuge in flight but when all the circumstances connected with it are taken into consideration i am sure every fair-minded person will acquit me of this charge had i been alone it is possible i might have turned and risked an encounter with the man but consuelo being with me rendered such a course impossible for the first time since we had known it the grim old castle perched up on the cliff seemed a desirable place and it was with a feeling of profound relief that i led my sweetheart across the drawbridge and was able to tell myself for the time being at least she was safe on reaching the hall i found that i still had twenty minutes to spare i had no desire however for further leisure what i wanted was to see nikola at once in order to tell him my unpalatable news on entering the room i found him engaged in taking the old man's temperature he looked up at me as if he were surprised to see me return so soon i said nothing until he had finished the work upon which he was engaged i can see from your face that you have had a fright that you have something to say to me concerning it he began 
when he returned the thermometer to its case. Our friend Kwong Ma has turned up again, I suppose. How did you know it? I asked. For I had no idea that he was aware of the man's appearance in the neighbourhood. I guessed it, he answered with one of his peculiar smiles. You are the possessor of a most expressive countenance. Consider for a moment. You will understand how it is I am able to arrive at a conclusion so quickly. In the first place, you've been for a walk with the young lady whom you love and who loves you in return. Perhaps you saw me, I replied sharply, feeling myself blushing to the roots of my hair. I have not left this room, he answered. There's a long black hair on your collar which should not have been there if you had spent your liberty by yourself. The same thing tells me that you love her and she loves you. As for the other matter, the caretaker and his wife have been busily employed in the castle all morning, while our wind never leaves its own portion of the premises. There is only one person outside the walls who could have put that expression into your face, and that person is Kwong Ma. Am I right? Quite right, I replied. He followed me along the sands and hid himself among the rocks. In recrossing them from the point, I, as nearly as possible, jumped on him. I'm very glad you did not quite do so, he answered. Had you experienced that misfortune, you would not have been here to tell the tale. But enough of him for the present. Take your place here and watch our patient. In an hour's time, his temperature should have risen two points. When it has done so, give him ten drops of this fluid in twenty drops of distilled water. A profuse perspiration should result, which will herald the return of consciousness and the new life. In twenty-four hours he should not only be conscious, but on his way to the commencement of his second youth. In forty-eight the improvement should be firmly established, while in a week we should have him on his legs, a living, moving, thinking man, and of my own creation. Watch him, therefore, and whatever happens, do not leave this room. Meanwhile I'll have the drawbridge raised, and if Kwong Ma can leap the chasm, and make his way into the castle, well, all I can say is he's a cleverer man than I take him to be. With that, Nicola left me, and I sat down to watch beside the aged Don. Apart from my duty towards him, I had plenty to think about, over and over again. I found myself recalling the incidents of the morning. Consuelo loved me, and happen what might, I would prove myself worthy of her love. At the end of the hour, as Nicola had predicted, the patient's temperature had risen two points. I accordingly measured out the stipulated quantity of the medicine he had placed in readiness for me, added the necessary quantity of water and poured it into the old man's mouth. Then I sat myself down to wait. Slowly the hands of the clock upon the wall went round, and sixty minutes later, just as Nicola had prophesied, small beads of perspiration made their appearance upon his forehead. It was an exciting moment, and one for which we had been eagerly waiting. I immediately rang the bell for Nicola, and upon his arrival informed him of the fact. At last, at last, he whispered, it is certain now that I have made no mistake. From this moment forward his progress should be assured. In a week you will be rewarded by a sight such as the eye of man has never yet seen. Be faithful to me, Ingleby. I pledge my word that your future with a woman you love is assured. For the remainder of that day, and indeed until eleven o'clock in the morning the following, there was but little change in the old Don's condition. The casual observer would have seen but little difference from the day on which I had first taken charge of him on board the steamer. To Nicola and myself, however, who had spent so much time with him, and who had noted every change, there was a difference so vast that it seemed almost incomprehensible. My watch the next morning was from four o'clock until eight. At eight I breakfasted, and afterwards repaired to the battlements above in the hope of meeting Consuelo. Since Nicola had ordered the drawbridge to be raised, we had been compelled to make this our meeting place, and as it happened, Consuelo was the first at the rendezvous. A good news for me, she cried after I had kissed her. Can you, I can see it in your face. What is it? Does it concern my great-grandfather? It does, I answered. It concerns him inasmuch as I am able to tell you that what Nicola promised you should happen has in reality come to pass. 
everything has been satisfactory beyond our wildest hopes and do you mean that all need of anxiety is over she cried i don't mean that exactly i answered but i think it's very possible we should soon be able to say so nikola is certainly the most wonderful man upon this earth what she said in reply it would be vanity on my part to recall it would only be another instance of the folly of lovers talk let it suffice that for upwards of an hour our converse was of the sweetest description. Hand in hand, we sat upon the battlements, looking out across the sunlit sea, and building our castles in the air. We were interrupted by our whim, who suddenly made his appearance before us, and beckoned me to follow him. Bidding Consuelo good-bye, I followed the fellow to the hall, where he pointed to the old Don's room and left me. I found Nicola in a state of wildest excitement. I sent for you because the crisis is close at hand, he whispered. At any moment now I may know my fate. Little by little I have built up this worn-out frame, strengthening and renewing, revivifying, and now the object of my ambition is almost achieved. A thousand years ago the secret was guessed by a certain sect in Asia. After working a hundred or more years upon it, they at length perfected it, but by the law of their order only one man was permitted to derive any benefit from it. I obtained their secret, how it does not matter. Added to it what I thought it lacked, and here is the result. As he spoke, a visible tremor ran over the form on the bed before us. The excitement was well nigh unbearable. For the first time in more than thirty days movement was to be detected. The eyelids flickered, the mouth twitched, and little by little the eyes opened. Nicola immediately stooped over him and concentrated all his attention upon the pupils, and placing his fingertips so close that they almost touched the lashes, he drew them away again in long transverse passes. Do you know me? he asked in a voice that shook with emotion. Almost instantly the man replied, I know you. Do you suffer any pain? I do not. Sleep then, rest and gain strength, and in two days from this hour wake again a strong man. Once more he placed his hands before the patient's eyes. As he drew them away, the lids closed. Nicola bent over him and listened, and when he rose he nodded reassuringly to me. It's all right, he said. His respiration is as even and unbroken as that of a sleeping child. As usual, my watch that night was from eight o'clock until midnight. From the fact that Don Miguel continued to sleep as quietly at that moment as when Nicola had hypnotised him, it was neither as difficult nor as anxious as before. Nor was I altogether discontented with my lot. I was in love. I was loved in my turn. I was engaged in deeply interesting employment, which should the experiment terminate successfully, would in all probability ensure my being able to start for a second time in my profession, and with an added knowledge that it would bring me to the top of the tree at once. The room in which I sat was warm and comfortable. Outside, however, a violent storm was raging. The rain and wind beat against the window in the hall with the wildest fury. Now, ever since I had watched by the Don's bedside, I had made it my habit to carefully lock the door as soon as Nicola left the room. On this particular occasion, I had not departed from my custom. The hands of the clock on the wall stood at ten minutes past eleven, and I was reflecting that I should not be sorry when my watch was over and I at liberty to retire to bed, when, to my astonishment, I saw the handle of the door slowly turn. At first, I almost believed that my imagination was playing me a trick. But when the handle revolved and was afterwards turned again, I was satisfied that this was not the case. Who was the person on the other side? It would not be our win, for the reason that he had been particularly instructed, on no account ever to touch the door. Consuelo would not venture into that portion of the castle again on any consideration whatsoever while Nicola himself, being aware that I always kept it locked, would have knocked before attempting to enter. Whoever it was must have been satisfied that the task was a hopeless one. At any rate, he desisted, and I heard no more of him. 
A few moments later the ventilator required my attention, and I was too busy to bestow any more thought upon the matter. Indeed, it was not until Nicola knocked upon the door and relieved me that it entered my mind again. It became apparent immediately that he attached more importance to the incident than I was inclined to do. Very strange, he said, but it accounts for one thing which I must confess has puzzled me. What is that? I inquired. I yeah, will show you, he answered, and led the way to the hall. At the further end, near the window, he paused and pointed to a mark upon the floor. Not being able to see it very distinctly, I went down upon my hands and knees. Do you know what it is? asked Nicola. I do, I answered. It is the print of a naked foot. Yes, said Nicola, and that foot was wet. It was more than that. Here he took a magnifying glass from his pocket and also went down upon his hands and knees. The chimney leading from our wind's room, he said, is almost exactly above our heads. In consequence, as you may have noticed, the battlements at that point are invariably covered with smuts. The naked foot, which made this mark, brought some of these particles with it, which tells us that there was only one way in which the owner could have come, and that was down a rope and through the window. Let us examine the window. We did so, but so far as I could see, there was nothing there to reward us. The rain was pelting down, and the wind blew as I had never heard it before. The man, whoever he was, was certainly not deficient in pluck, said Nicola. I shouldn't have cared to lower myself over the battlements on a night like this. Are you sure that he did not lower himself? I inquired. Are you sure that he did so lower himself? I inquired. I'm quite sure, Nicola answered. How else could he have come? The old Don is safe for half an hour at least. Get your revolver. I will get mine and we'll go upstairs in search of the intruder. I did as he directed, but with no great willingness. As you may suppose, I was quite convinced as to the identity of the mysterious visitor, and knowing his proficiency in the art of knife-throwing, I had not the smallest desire to become better acquainted with him. However, I was not going to allow Nicola to think I was afraid. So putting the best face I could upon it, I did as he directed, and having assured myself that my weapon was loaded in every chamber, I followed him along the corridor, up the stone staircase, and so out onto the battlements above. Of all the storms in my experience, I think that particular one was certainly the worst. The rain beat in our faces, and so great was the strength of the wind that the very castle itself seemed to shake and tremble before it. Revolver in hand, expecting every moment to be confronted by the man of whom we were in search, I followed Nicola in the direction of the engine room chimney. I knew very well for what he was looking. He thought he would find a rope there, but in this he was disappointed nor were we able to discover any traces of human beings. We searched the whole length of the battlements in vain, and at last were perforce compelled to give up the hunt as hopeless. Returning to the stairway once more, we were about to descend when I saw Nicholas Stoop pick something up. Whatever it was, he said nothing to me until we had reached the light of the corridor below. Then he held it up for me to see. It was a grey felt hat, the same that I'd seen upon the Chinaman's head that morning. Mark my words, said Nicola, we shall have trouble with Kwong Ma before very long. End of chapter 7